Mario Party. Welcome to Identifying Luck for the Original Mario Party. It is here where we will learn how to best improve our odds of winning at the only Mario Party game that consistently takes away your coins for losing. Let's hop into the pipe and take care of our first item on the list. The bonus stars. We've got the coin star, happening star, and minigame star. This third one awards the player that collected the most amount of coins from minigames, but what this bonus star considers a viable minigame varies from title to title. In this title, standard minigames and one-player minigames are what's counted, nothing else. Remember how I said this game likes to take away your coins for losing? Well, it also makes sure to subtract the same amount of coins from your total minigame coins earned. Interestingly enough, this is the only Mario Party where bonus stars aren't optional. You have to play with them on. Something that is optional, however, is the use of these six dice blocks that can be purchased in the Mushroom Shop. They all have different attributes from one another, and if you were to turn them all on, then each player would have a small chance of having to roll one of them instead of the average dice block. We also have the no Koopa sign and the no Boo sign. Let's first go over what each of these characters do while present on the board. Koopa Troopa grants coins to players that pass him. He'll grant 10 coins prior to the final 5 turns and 20 coins during. He'll also grant 20 coins to the 10th player that passes him. While the no Koopa sign is being used, Koopa Troopa will not appear on the board, so players won't be making as many coins as they normally would throughout the course of a game. Boo lets players steal coins or stars from other players. It costs nothing to steal coins. The amount of coins stolen is randomly selected from numbers 1 through 15. No amount of player input on either end of the steal will increase or reduce the amount of coins stolen. It costs 50 coins to steal a star, and just like the coin steal, player input affects nothing. You have to take it. <laughs> Unlike future titles which have items to prevent players from taking your stuff, this game has none of those. So if you're being stolen from, then you have to accept your fate. That being said, the only reason to not have Boo steal for you in this game is if you don't want to upset your competition and put a target on your back. While the Nobu sign is being used, Boo will not appear on the board, so players won't be able to steal coins or stars from other players, which will make it way harder for players to pull ahead if they're falling far behind. Boo naturally does not appear on Peach's birthday cake, and Koopa Troopa naturally does not appear on Eternal Star. Remember, using any of these items I listed is optional. They are not on by default. Blue, Red, Happening, Bowser, Chance, Mushroom, and Minigame. During the final 5 turns, blue spaces and red spaces will always have their coin values doubled from 3 to 6. The events that the happening spaces trigger in this title are ruthless. We'll cover every one of them once we get to analyzing each board. Bowser spaces trigger the Bowser Roulette, which can result in these following events. Coins for Bowser. Bowser takes 10 to 30 coins from the player who landed on his space. This is the most common Bowser event in Mario Party 2, but in this title it gets randomly selected just as often as the others. These next four events are minigames with modified outcomes. I'll list their names, but won't go further in detail until we get to the minigame section. Bowser Balloon Burst, Bowser's Facelift, Bowser's Tug of War, Bash and Cash. Bowser Revolution. Bowser takes everyone's coins and splits them evenly among all players. This is actually a fantastic outcome for the players that are lagging behind in coins. It's one of the few events where the player who landed on the Bowser space can actually end up in a much better position than the one they originally started in. Bowser's Chance Time. This is Bowser's modified version of Chance Time. I'll talk more about this event when we cover Chance Time, which is coming up pretty quick. 100 star present, 1000 coin present, and star steal. These are all in yellow text. The cursor very rarely lands on these events. If it does, Bowser leaves and does nothing. While it is a ripoff that he doesn't follow through with any of these events, the bright side is that no one loses anything, so that's something to be happy about. If the player who lands in the Bowser space has at least one star but no coins, Bowser gives the player 10 coins in exchange for one star. This is actually one of the worst outcomes from landing on a Bowser space because it's the only one that makes you lose a star. If you're in possession of at least one, one star, make sure you have at least one coin too, because if you don't, then you're really going to regret landing on a Bowser space. If the player has no coins or stars, Bowser gives the player 20 coins. Oddly enough, if you have no stars and no coins, going for a Bowser space is actually a great move to make, so if the option presents itself, you should take it, unless you see a different available option called the Chance Space, which appears on boards naturally while also appearing on the board whenever a star is purchased. Landing on one of these spaces triggers the event that those falling behind love and those far ahead hate. True to the name, this event serves as a chance to flip the game on its head. 
but when we're done with it, it'll be choice time instead. In this tile, the player has to hit three orange blocks to decide what will happen. Two of the blocks have pictures of all four players' heads, and the one in the middle shows what they are swapping, coins or stars. The player can hit the blocks in any order, but whatever the order, the remaining blocks spin faster with each hit. The order in which the player's heads are shown in the side dice is directly correlated with the turn order. For example, if the turn order is Peach, Luigi, Yoshi, Mario, then the side dice will also roll in that order, Peach, Luigi, Yoshi, Mario. Once a player has been selected, they will disappear off of the other dice block to ensure that they don't trade with themselves. The middle dice block, which determines what will be traded between the two players, will always, always roll on the same cycle, so you can memorize the entire pattern but where the dice block starts in the cycle is random. But not everyone will find it easy to memorize the whole pattern, so what are some general tips for this tile's chance time? Well, when the block is spinning its fastest, it's easier to land on the player you want instead of the trade you want. This is the case for both jumping at random and trying to time your jump. If you choose to jump at random, then it's basic probability. You have a 1 in 3 chance of getting the player you want as opposed to a 1 in 10 chance of getting the trade you want. If you choose to time it before you jump, it's easier to keep track of the player icons since they're color-coded as opposed to the trade icons, which look quite similar. My suggestion is that you choose what's being traded first. If you haven't memorized the whole pattern, then just focus on the spinning block until you see the trade you desire. Then memorize at least two trades before your desired one so you'll know when it's about to come up. Once you see the trades you marked in your head spin by, jump to hit the trade you want. The side dice blocks will then spin faster, but you shouldn't select a side just yet, as most trades distinguish between left and right, and you're more likely to land in what you want for the second dice block than the third. So think about what you want in each side, then determine which side is more important to get correct. Make that side you hit for your second dice block. This way you'll save the less important side for the most difficult to land dice block. If the trade you selected at the beginning was the swap coins or swap stars one, then go on either side and land on the player with the most amount of what's going to be traded so you can at least ensure their demise. Bowser's chance time. It's like chance time, but Bowser rigs it so that he is on the receiving end of the trade. Unlike normal chance time, stars cannot be lost. This event isn't as bad as it could be. While both dice blocks are spinning at their fastest possible speed, you only have a 1 in 4 chance of being selected to lose something, and that something is only 10 to 30 coins. What makes it even better is that you're not going to be giving your coins away to another player in the game, just Bowser. So while Bowser's chance time may sound scary, just know that the odds are in your favor, and even if it doesn't work out, it's still not nearly as bad as it could be. Back to our less descriptive spaces. The mushroom space makes a player roll for either a mushroom or a poison mushroom. The former will give the player another dice block, whereas the latter will make the player miss their next turn. While it looks like you can time your jump to easily get the mushroom, I'm sorry to crush your dreams by saying it's predetermined. No well-timed jumps will save you from the 50-50 odds of losing a turn. This is why it's better to steer clear from these spaces if you can. Only purposely land on one if you need to make a big play or just don't care if you may not get to roll next turn. Here's our last one, the minigame space. This space is flat out overpowered. When a player lands on it, they play a single player minigame to earn coins for only themselves. Most of these single player minigames are easy, so the player will almost always end up gaining a healthy sum of coins. And as I said at the beginning, these coins the player gains count towards the minigame star. So a player has high potential to get an easy minigame to collect coins from in addition to furthering their lead for the minigame star. And no other player can prevent them from doing Doing so because these are single player mini games. All that being said, if you can land in this space, go for it. More often than not, you'll be rewarded. This title boasts a lot of boards. Out of all the Mario Party titles 1 through 7, this one has the most boards at 8. While 6 of them are named after and belong to the 6 playable characters in the game, there aren't any advantages granted to a character if they happen to play on their home board. This title gives each board a difficulty rating in the form of these stars. The more there are, the more difficult the board, or at least according to the developers. I'm a little hesitant to give my own difficulty ratings for these boards since they vary depending on how many turns you're playing and the kinds of people you're playing with. They can be inaccurate at times, so I'm not going to do them. Our first stop is DK's Jungle Adventure. Here's the space lineup. Out of all the boards, it has the most amount of blue spaces at 59, ties for the most amount of red spaces at 7, and has the second most amount of happening spaces at 9. The reason why these numbers are so high compared to the other boards is because this board has the most amount of total spaces out of all of them at 86. 
Here's a good opportunity to explain how the star space works. On most boards, when you purchase a star, the star space itself will move to another random location. However, it can't move to any space in the board at once since only certain spaces have been programmed to host a star. We call these spaces star spaces, and normally only one is active at a time. When a star space isn't active, it looks like your average blue space. For this board, the star is going to randomly spawn at one of these seven star spaces. Once a star is purchased at the active star space, it will deactivate and a different star space on the board will become active. When a star space is deactivated, it will not activate again until every other star space on the board has been deactivated. Once the last star space deactivates, then every star space on the board now regains the potential to become the next active one. A star space cannot spawn in the same place twice in a row. Cool, let's say you're in the middle of the game. You recall that these five star spaces have been deactivated, and you notice that the current active star space is this one. So I ask you, where will the next star spawn? The only possibility is right here, since all the other ones are either deactivated or will deactivate after its star has been purchased. Having this knowledge and applying it while you play can be the difference between you winning a game or losing a game, since this is a feature that many people will claim is unpredictable. But as we've seen here, there are ways to increase your chances of guessing or flat out knowing where the next star will pop up. Any part of a board where players may have the option to take one path or another is called a junction. This board's junctions function in the form of these womps that guard some of the splitting paths. If a player takes the path that a womp is not blocking, it will move to block that path afterwards. If a player wishes to gain access to the path that a womp is blocking, then they must pay 10 coins to pass, and the womp will continue to block that same path. These are coin stones. Players can only pass if they have 20 coins. Otherwise, the path being blocked won't be made available to them. If a player passes Bowser on this board, then they'll be forced to purchase a completely useless Bowser statue for 10 coins, and to top it all off, there are two boos on the board. No other Mario Party board from tiles 1 to 7 have two boos on the board at once, which is madness. But the madness continues because the order in which players take their turn on this board actually matters, at least for the beginning. On the early turns, players will most likely want to take the path leading up, since there's a 6 in 7 chance that the first star appeared in this huge chunk of the board instead of this small one. The reason why turn order matters here is because of this womp. Whoever goes first only needs to roll at least a 5 to take the path leading up for free, while every other player will need to pay 10 coins to take that same path. With everything I've told you about this board, is an early coin deficit really something you want? The answer is clearly no, but it's not like you have much of a choice. I mean, it's not like you can make the turn order whatever you want. Or can you? No. You can't. But that's okay, there's other tips to be found here. The womp at this junction isn't as brutal, since both paths lead to the same place, but going up is still preferred since the space layout is a lot more desirable. Boasting a minigame space, we know how good those are, and two happening spaces, which as we all know, count towards the delightful happening star. But before you land in one of them to increase your lead for one of the bonus stars, consider this. Every happening space on this board will trigger a boulder to start rolling down from this mountain. Any players caught on the path of this boulder will be forced to end up at this space. So before you choose to land on one of these happening spaces, consider if moving yourself to this space along with anyone else that gets caught is a good play. Also be cautious of your placement on the board at all times, since you yourself may get caught up in the boulder's path by one of your opponents activating a happening space. Use one of the boos on players that are ahead and barely have above the 20 coin or 10 coin coin threshold. This will restrict the pass that they're able to take, making it more difficult for them to up their game. For the most part, you only want to steal a star on this board if the cost for doing so won't put you under 20 coins. The less options you have, the worse off you are. If a star happens to spawn in this path leading down, then consider if it's worth 10 coins since that's what you're going to lose when you pass by Bowser. These spaces are also on the path of the boulder, so if your opponents are all clumped up over here, then it's highly likely that one of them will trigger the event and move you down. This is the hardest star on the board to obtain due to all of these factors. For this junction, the left path is the better option, despite this Bowser space, since you get to visit Boo, and you have a higher chance of landing on a happening space. What's great about the placements for these happening spaces especially, is that you aren't in the boulder's path, so you can freely activate them knowing nothing bad will happen to you. The path back to the star mainly consists of safe blue spaces with a big old Bowser space slapped on. What sucks about its placement is that it's right in front of the space that you'll end up on if you're caught in the boulder's path. Yet another reason to pay close attention to where people are. 
you'll rarely find yourself turning left at the first junction since the paths loop back around quickly and only contain one star space. Every minigame space here is on a branching path, so before you make your selection, check to see if you can land on one, and if you can, then you should probably go for it. Overall, DK's Jungle Adventure has events that combo really well together, creating an atmosphere where anyone who has a low amount of coins is going to suffer more than they already would on a normal board. Onto the sweetest board of all, Peach's Birthday Cake. Here's the space lineup. Out of all the boards, it has the most amount of happening spaces at 14, Bowser spaces at 4, Chance spaces at 3, and Mushroom spaces at 7. Isn't it funny how they gave the most amount of Mushroom spaces to the food board? Anyways, this board has one star space that's active the entire time. There aren't any junctions on this board, which means movement here is a lot more dependent on your roll than your decision making. When players reach the Goomba, they must pay 10 coins or all their coins if they have 10 or less to play a game called the Flower Lottery. There are four seeds of different colors and the player must choose to bloom one. Three of them have Toad's face imprinted inside them. If the player finds one, they'll lose and take the star's path. However, if the player chooses the seed with Bowser's face, they'll win and are forced to proceed to Bowser's cake. Only once every seed has been bloomed will another set appear. In addition, the colors of the seeds are irrelevant and it's impossible to know which seed is going to have which face. Your chances of getting a toad are higher the more seeds there are to choose from. So for this board, whoever goes first will have a slight advantage. If a player is unlucky enough to end up at Bowser's cake, then they'll eventually pass King Koopa himself and be forced to buy the completely useless, not to mention inedible, Bowser cake for 20 coins. What makes this worse is that it happens only a few spaces away from the star, greatly reducing your chances of being able to afford it. If a player lands on a happening space, then they can bury a strawberry seed for 30 coins, that then grows into a piranha plant. If a different player lands on the space, then they will lose a star that the barrier will gain. The plant will then disappear unless that target has no star, in which case the plant will do nothing and stay. Is it really worth 30 of your coins for the chance that a different player with a star will land in the space you've claimed? The answer is, it depends. If you're way ahead in star count and coin count, then spending that many coins may be unnecessary to your overall game. If it put you below the amount to purchase a star, then it's also worth reconsidering. But since it's easy to get a star on this board, you may find yourself in a game where you and the other players have a fairly even spread of stars and coins. So if you know that you're lagging behind in bonus stars or just want to take the risk, then it may be worth it to lay down 30 coins on a couple happening spaces. Now let's say you're on your way to the flower lottery with around 30 coins and three of the four seeds people have chosen are all toads. That means you're going to get Bowser and will end up losing 20 coins to him a few spaces later. If you're caught in this kind of situation, then immediately spend 30 coins on a happening space, as they'll be way more useful there than in Bowser's claws. Overall, the punishment players receive for playing on Peach's birthday cake varies depending on how many turns are being played, since that greatly affects the power of these happening spaces. The longer a game goes on, the higher the total coin count among all players will be, which means that most players will easily be able to afford putting down 30 coins to own these spaces. They wouldn't be able to afford purchasing as many spaces in a short game since they wouldn't have enough coins to do so. It's also more worth it to own a happening space in a long game than a short one since the chances of a player landing on it are increased due to a higher amount of overall spaces being landed on. Time for Yoshi's Tropical Island. Here's the space lineup. Out of all the boards, it doesn't have the most amount of any space. It instead has the least amount of red spaces at 3, and ties for the least amount of Bowser spaces at 2. Out of all Mario Party tiles 1-7, through 7, it has the second to least amount of total spaces. The board with the least amount of total spaces out of any Mario Party board will be covered a little while from now. This board has Toad and Bowser on opposite islands. If a player passes Toad, they can purchase a star like normal, but if they pass Bowser, then they'll be forced to buy a completely useless and ineffective Bowser tube for 30 coins. Stepping on a happening space will make Bowser and Toad switch places. There are two thwomps that block the bridges to the opposite island and request a fee from players if they want to pass to the other island. The fee always starts at one coin, but goes up by at least one coin each time a player pays to pass. The fee can never lower, its limit is 50 coins, and the two thwomps do not share the same fee. Players can choose to pay many more coins than the previous amount to make the bridges inaccessible to players that don't have enough coins to pay the fee. If you have a lot more coins than the other players, then it may be worth it to raise the fee by a bunch to block the pass that they want to take. 
Boo's located on the top of the right island. Using Boo to steal a star on this board is a risky maneuver, as you run the risk of not being able to afford passage along the bridges due to your recent 50 coin deficit. If you want to steal a star, it's best if you do so when you have coins to spare. Regardless of your strategy, remember what each fee is for each thwomp. That'll let you know which pass are available to which players. Knowing what your opponent's options are at any given time will help you out no matter what game you're playing. At any point before deciding whether or not you should spend your coins to pass the bridge, check the map to see if you can land on a minigame space. You'll most likely break even or even gain more coins than you spent to land on it. Also remember that these spaces count towards the minigame bonus star, so they're still worth landing on even if you lose a few coins in the process. The turn order is irrelevant on this board since happening spaces shake things up so often that no one should really be comfortable with where they're located. This is why it's really difficult to give advice on what player's first move should be. It could be completely safe to move towards Toad one turn just for someone to land on a happening space and switch him with Bowser the next. Keep a close eye on your opponent's locations. It'll let you know the chances that a happening space will be landed on. If if a player is on any of these spaces, then they have an extremely low chance of landing on a happening space. The only way it'd be possible is if they roll a 10 to land on this mushroom space, win the 50-50 for the mushroom, and roll a 7 to land on the happening space. Excluding that completely unlikely scenario, if a player is on these spaces, you can breathe a sigh of relief that they won't be landing on a happening space anytime soon. If a player is on any space other than the ones previously mentioned, then they have a fair shot for landing on a happening space. Overall, Yoshi's Tropical Island has the potential for getting crazy. Remember how every time a player passes a thwomp, they have to pay at least one coin more than the previous amount? Well, the longer a game goes on, the more times players are going to be paying these thwomps, meaning there's a high chance that the fees players have to pay are going to get ridiculous by the later turns. However, paying these fees to cross the bridges isn't a necessary task to win the game most of the time, all thanks to the aforementioned happening spaces that swap Toad and Bowser around. While this board may have an incredibly low amount of spaces, that doesn't keep it from getting pretty hectic. Welcome to Wario's Battle Canyon, here's the space lineup. Out of all the boards, it has the most amount of minigame spaces at 10, and ties for the most amount of red spaces at 7. Here are the 7 star spaces. What you'll notice is that their locations vary between these 5 platforms. If a player wishes to travel to another platform, they must pass up a bomb so they can be fired there using a cannon. However, players don't get to choose which platform they fire to since all cannons are aimed in the following sequence no matter how many times you restart the board. Bottom left shoots to bottom right, bottom right shoots to top left, top left shoots to top right, and top right shoots back down to bottom left. If a happening space is landed on, then this order is reversed. When a player is fired to another platform, a roulette starts to choose which space the player is going to land on before walking any remaining spaces. This roulette is completely random. There's no reoccurring pattern to memorize. The game just flings the cursor all over the place in a frustratingly unpredictable manner. You do have influence to where you'll end up since the cursor will only choose a space when you tell it to, but as we can see right here, the roulette's going way too fast in order for you to choose the space you want. However, if you were a robot and had a reaction time of instant, you would be able to get it instantly, so there you go. You can only be launched to blue spaces, minigame spaces, chance spaces, and red spaces. No other spaces can be landed on. The cursor doesn't hover over the same space twice, although it can fling between the same two spaces over and over again. While these bits of information may be a little helpful in learning how this roulette works, it just cycles through random spaces at such a quick rate to make everything said here practically inapplicable, so just fire away and hope for the best. If a player wants to willfully influence where they or another player go on this board, Fly Guy, who's located on the top right platform, is their only option. Players can pay him 10 coins to either carry them to the middle platform or carry another player to this space. They can also choose to not pay and continue along the path they're on. Let's talk about each option. The middle platform has loads of glorious minigame spaces on it along with a potential star space. The downside to going here is that players will inevitably meet up with Bowser, lose 20 coins, and get launched to a random platform, which will then trigger the roulette. Speaking of which, when a player pays 10 coins to travel here, then they'll also have to go through the roulette. So if a player is looking to get the star that pops up here, then they have a 50-50 chance of landing on one of the right spaces to get. Overall, traveling to this middle platform is a pain. While you may be able to land on a minigame space and acquire a star, which does outweigh the negative of losing 30 coins altogether, you still run the risk of losing 30 coins and getting nothing else if you end up with bad luck. I recommend only going to this platform if you're guaranteed to land on a minigame space 
or if you absolutely need to get another star to win. Having Fly Guy bring a player of your choice to this space is a good move if they're either too close to the star or Boo, who's located on the top left platform. Not paying the Fly Guy and continuing on your path is a fine choice as well, just take into account what space you're going to land on and if landing on that space will either help or hurt your game. Overall, Wario's Battle Canyon is heavily role dependent, which means even memorizing all 7 star spaces won't help you out much since the only decision you can willfully make in terms of movement is through Fly Guy, which doesn't leave players many options. Luigi's Engine Room is complex to say the least. Here's the space lineup. Out of all the boards, it's actually quite average in terms of its space layout. The only thing worth mentioning is that it has the second most amount of total spaces. Here are the seven star spaces. The main feature of this board are these red and blue doors. One set rises up to block specific paths, while the other set goes down to open up other paths. The doors switch at the start of every turn, when players land on certain happening spaces, these ones, or if this robot on the board is paid 20 coins to switch them. It's easy to forget that the doors switch at the beginning of every turn. Don't let yourself take a path without remembering that the doors have potential to change positions. In fact, I can't stress enough just how important it is to check your map every time you make a decision in general in every Mario Party. If you pass the robot at the bottom of the board and can pay 20 coins to prevent a player from extending their lead, then you may want to do it. Inversely, pay attention to how close other players are to this robot so they don't end up screwing you out of a star. There aren't any star spaces located on the main path, which means there will almost always be an opportunity for players to block other players off from any star that pops up. This is a lot to remember, and it's only made worse when we factor in these three happening spaces, which also switch the doors. Let's just be thankful that they're unlikely to be landed upon. These other two happening spaces launch players directly up to this path, which contains the hardest star space to reach on this board. No matter where players go, all paths and warp pipes that lead to Boo. If you want to ensure that a certain player can't switch the doors using the robot, then you've got to get them below 20 coins. Boo can help you out on this mission, however. Just target the troublemaker and hope you steal a lot of coins. For the first branching path here, check the map and consider your options. If you can land on the minigame space, want to use the robot, or want to stay in the same area and wait for the doors to switch, then go down. Otherwise, go left. This third reason for going down is something we call stalling. It's something a player does when they want to stay in the same area of the board they're on. In this case, a player may not want to take the open path for one of the doors, so they may instead decide to take this path with more spaces so they can wait until the door switch next turn. If a player passes Bowser, then he'll use his make as many coins as you want mecha to produce one coin for the player, which sounds nice if it weren't for the fact that he takes 20 coins from said player afterwards. That's a 19 coin loss. Not so nice. Overall, Luigi's Engine Room may seem a bit overwhelming at first, but once you learn its mechanics and how to manage them, then it's not all that bad. Mario's Rainbow Castle may seem quite fluffy and carefree compared to the other boards, but it can dish out some serious punishment at times. Here's the space lineup. Out of all the boards, it has the least amount of blue spaces at 33 and the least amount of mushroom spaces at 2. In fact, out of all the boards in Mario Party tiles 1 through 7, this one has the least amount of total spaces at 53. That's tiny! But don't let that small number fool you as its main gimmick takes all of this into account. This board has a couple splitting paths here and there, but no matter which path players take, they'll eventually end up at the middle of the board, where they'll have to take this cloud up to the tower to visit either Toad or Bowser. If a star is purchased from Toad, then the tower will spin around and Bowser will take Toad's place. If a player visits him, then they'll be forced to purchase a star at the cost of 40 coins. Afterwards, the tower will spin around and Toad will take Bowser's place, and so on. It's a very simple concept, but one that requires players to be aware of who's on the tower at the time and who's closest to said tower. Let's say you're right here, and the other players are here. Bowser is currently occupying the tower. Obviously, you don't want to visit Bowser, you'd rather someone else see him instead so he can swap with Toad, someone you do want to visit. In order to make sure the other players get ahead of you and see Bowser, you should take this path going right since it has more spaces than this path going down. This is a successful stall and will make it so you don't get to the cloud as quickly as you normally would. Receiving a star or a star is not the only way for the tower to spin. If any happening space is landed on, then the same event will happen. 
Toad and Bowser will switch places. If someone you don't want to get a star is about to visit Toad, then try to land in a happening space so they visit Bowser instead. Couple a strategy with counting your spaces to gain an edge over the other players. If all else fails, then it may be worth it to visit Boo and steal some coins, or maybe even a star. Don't forget that there's two chance time spaces on the board either. Overall, Mario's Rainbow Castle has an easy to understand yet punishing gimmick that players need to get a good handle of if they want to win. Bowser's Magma Mountain is not a fun board to play on. Here's the space lineup. Out of all the boards, it has the potential to carry the most amount of red spaces at a whopping 50. We'll get into that later, but as of right now, here are its 7 star spaces. There are 3 junctions on the board that players can pay 10 coins to use if they want to take a shortcut that will let them skip 10 spaces on average. This sounds fantastic if it weren't for this little detail. If a player accepts taking this shortcut, then they must pay the fee, and a roulette block will appear showing a star face and Bowser's face. If the player gets the star face, they are allowed to take the shortcut. However, if they get Bowser's face, they have to continue on their present route with no refund. What makes it worse is that it looks like you can time your jump to get the star face, but you can't. It's predetermined just like your average dice block. When arriving at one of these junctions, check the map and consider your options. Is the star space on the path you've already been traveling on? Then don't try to take the shortcut. Inversely, can you get to a star space before the other players if you take the shortcut? Then it may be worth going for it. There's one junction located on the top of the board. When a player gets here, they are forced to hit another roulette, this one free of charge. Getting the star face takes them to Boo, and Bowser's face takes them to Bowser, where he steals either 20 coins or a star, depending on yet another 50-50 roulette block. If you own a star, then you want to avoid this section of the board at all costs. You can do so through this junction, where if you win the roulette, then you can take a shortcut that bypasses all the danger at the cost of 10 coins. Even better, you'll pass Koopa Troopa some spaces later and gain at least 10 coins, which will balance out the transaction. However, if you do this, then you lose your chance to visit Boo, who can get you coins on a board that wants nothing more than to take them all away. Stealing a star here isn't that bad of an idea either, since the person you steal from will only have a 50-50 shot at reaching Boo to revenge steal back. It's all a balancing act, so when you reach this junction, consider if the potential benefit for visiting Boo outweighs the potential risk of visiting Bowser. If a player lands on a happening space, then the volcano will erupt and all blue spaces will turn into red spaces. The event starts on that player's turn, and ends on that player's turn two turns later. While this event is active, this board has the highest amount of red spaces out of every board in Mario Party titles 1-7. Overall, Bowser's Magma Mountain can really stomp you down if you're not careful. Even if you consider all your options at each junction, you can still lose to bad luck due to these 50-50 roulettes. If all hope is lost, then target a chance space. If enough stars have been purchased on the board, then there most likely will be an opportunity for you to change the tide of the game. The final board of this title is Eternal Star. Here's the space lineup. It doesn't have anything that sticks out in terms of space count and space layout, but it does have the most confusing gimmick of all. Every path players take ends with a warp pad, which will warp players to another warp pad on the board. Just memorize which paths lead to which. Simple, you say. But oh no, it's not that simple. This board runs on what we call warp courses, and I was lucky enough to find that this person made an extremely helpful guide on how to fully understand this gimmick. Before we get into details, let's learn how to read this guide first. Both letters and numbers symbolize individual warp pads. Letter warp pads send players to number warp pads, so letters are where you warp from, and numbers are where you warp to. Looking at warp course 1 as an example, we can see that A warps to 2, B warps to 3, C warps to 7, and so on. Three separate warp courses exist. One of the three is selected at random as soon as the game starts. Our first objective should focus on figuring out which warp course we're on, as that'll let us know where every warp pad on the board leads to. Alright, let's travel upwards and take warp pad A. It leads to warp pad 2. Nice, let's find that combination on the guide. Here we go, A2, warp course 1. But wait a moment, A2 also exists on warp course 2 and warp course 3, so we still don't know which warp course we're on. That's right, we've got to take a warp pad that leads to a unique number for all three warp courses if we want to actually figure this out. What warp pad fulfills this criteria? A lot of them actually, but our best bet is warp pad D, since we're pretty close to it. Let's take it and see where we end up. Warp pad 6, that's D6, which can be found right here. And since D6 doesn't exist anywhere else in this guide, we know for certain that we're on warp course 3. Now whenever we take a warp pad, all we gotta do is check the guide for warp course 3 to figure out where we're gonna end up. 
So for example, if we take warp pad J, then we know for sure that we're going to end up at warp pad 9, which is... Bowser. Whenever a player visits Bowser, he'll steal a star or 20 coins if they don't have a star. He'll then return them to start and change the warp course. He will do this whenever a player visits him. If a player lands in a happening space, then Bowser will send everyone back to start without changing the warp course. If you learn how to read this guide and understand the tips I've given you, then you'll have a massive edge over players that mistakenly think that this board is luck based. They'll claim that you're incredibly lucky for getting boo every time while they get Bowser, when it'll really be your knowledge of the board, not luck, that's guiding you. Here are the 7 star spaces, but what makes them different from previous star spaces is that they're all active at the same time. Players will have to pay 20 coins as usual, however, they will be challenged to a dice block game, where the character with the higher number wins. The player's dice block is rigged to roll only numbers from 8 to 10. If the player wins, then they get the star like normal. If they lose, then they get a star taken away. When all 7 stars have been bought, 7 more will appear on the same spaces. Overall, Eternal Star is a fantastic example of how you can crush luck by applying your knowledge of how the game works. This title has 49 minigames that all have a chance to pop up in party mode. There's 24 4 player minigames, 10 1v3 minigames, 5 2v2 minigames, and 10 single player minigames. Out of all Mario Party titles 1 through 7, this one has the most 4 player minigames and the least 1v3 minigames. Certain minigames are different from others. Instead of the basic rewards for minigames played, 10 coins, the players get the amount of coins they collect. These minigames have a yellow font in game and will be referred to here on out as coins coin minigames. You'll notice that some of the descriptions for the Bowser minigames won't be specific regarding how many coins players will lose if they lose the minigame. This is because the amount of coins taken ranges from 10 to 50, and usually correlates with the current turn number. So if the game's been going on for a while, Bowser is likely to take more coins. Let's do it! 4 player minigames, Balloon Burst. Alternate pressing A and Z to blow up the Bowser balloon. B can be used instead of Z. When the pump flashes, it is full of air. When it's full, you can pump lots of air into the balloon. You need to nail the sweet spot, where you're pumping as much air as you can, as fast as you can. To do this, you need to alternate your button presses rhythmically at around 282 BPM, beats per minute. If done correctly, the game should end with about 13 to 14 seconds remaining. Most games played by people who don't know this rhythm will finish at around 10 seconds, so you'll be well off as long as you keep on pace and don't get distracted. The game ends when either a player pops their balloon or the time runs out, in which case the minigame will end in a draw and no one earns any coins. Bowser Balloon Burst Like the original Balloon Burst, but everyone who loses gets coins taken away. If the minigame ends in a tie, everyone loses coins. Bombs away. Cannons are aimed at the floating island. The island bobs and tilts with the waves, so don't fall in. You can see where each cannonball is being launched the moment it's shot. You can also see its shadow travel along the top of the water. Use these two details to predict where each shot will land. Any cannonball that hits the water will cause the island to tilt the opposite direction, so players need to adjust their position if they don't want to fall off. Cannonballs that hit the island while you're grounded will temporarily immobilize you. To avoid this, jump as soon as a cannonball strikes. If you jump on a player's head, then their movement speed will be reduced and they won't be able to jump, making it way more difficult for them to adjust to upcoming shots. Only jump on a player's head if they're near the middle of the island. Jumping on their head while they're on the edge puts you at risk for catapulting yourself into the ocean. Avoid getting directly hit by a cannonball. If you don't, then you'll get launched off the island and lose. The game ends when there is either one player remaining or the time runs out, in which case all remaining players win. Box Mountain Mayhem, a coin minigame. Break the mountain of stacked boxes, you can find coins inside. In the box mountain, there are also want blocks that bounce you back when you attack them. About 43 to 45 coins can be collected. Occasionally, players will find coin bags in some of the boxes. These are worth 5 coins apiece and are definitely worth getting. These items can be scattered around when a player breaks and reveals them in the open. If you see a coin bag drifting around, then make a mad dash to grab it. But if everybody goes for it, then it may be a better move to keep punching the mountain for guaranteed coins. Players can stun each other for a short time with different results. If you jump on someone, then they're partially flattened and cannot punch. If you punch someone, they'll get pushed back a few feet. If you attack someone with a ground pound, then they'll get flattened onto the ground and cannot move. 
If your aim is to get as many coins as possible, then you shouldn't waste your time harassing other players. But if you instead want to ensure that a certain player doesn't get many coins, then use punching to your advantage. This move has a short cooldown and can immobilize an opponent if used repeatedly against a wall. At best, the victim won't be able to move much at all, and at worst, they'll be trying to avoid you the entire time. Either way, they won't be gaining many coins. This isn't listed in the controls, but players can also kick while jumping. This isn't recommended, however, as it's a lot slower than repeatedly punching the blocks. Bumper Balls Ride your balls and try to bump others into the sea. Use your analog stick to roll around on your ball. Your strategy for winning should change depending on how many players are left. At the very beginning of the match, secure the middle of the platform so you aren't quickly eliminated. If two or more players are battling it out near a ledge, then build up your momentum and bump into them. Since bumping one player can cause a chain reaction, you can put yourself in a great position if the opportunity presents itself. If you're trying to bump someone off and see someone else is aiming for you, then immediately retreat and get to a safe position. Remember that you don't win by the amount of people you knock off. You win by being the last player remaining. When three to four players remain, you can use a technique that I've dubbed the slingshotter. To execute this technique, build up your momentum and roll in between two players, bumping into one of them. If done correctly, then your initial bump should fling you to the second player, then the first again, and so on. If you do this near the ledge, then you'll most likely knock someone off. If you do this near the middle of the platform, then you'll gain stage control over everyone else, who will most likely be near the ledge. While this technique can be used over and over again throughout a match, it could also also cause your opponents to team up and target you. If this happens, then try to stay in between them as much as possible, ironically executing the technique again and again. You won't be able to use the slingshot technique once it comes down to a 1v1. You're in the advantage if you're either at center field while they're by the ledge, or if you two keep bumping into each other, yet you're bumping them further away. If this is the situation, then never let up. Keep bumping them over and over. If you see them turn away for a retreat, predict their movements and ram into them with full force. If the two of you are bumping into each other repeatedly near the middle of the platform without any noticeable change, then you're at a stalemate. You could keep bumping into them and hold the stalemate for a draw if you don't want them to have any chance at winning, or you could take the more risky approach by backing off and attempting to build momentum to give yourself an advantage. This could definitely backfire on you if your opponent knows what you're doing and strikes you while you're vulnerable. If you're caught in a bad position, then make your movements unpredictable and get to safety. Buried Treasure Uncover the hidden arrows and try to find the treasure chest. Press A to repeatedly dig. Rocks are harder to dig through. The treasure chest will always spawn at a random location. Sometimes it will be in the middle of everyone and sometimes it will be right next to someone. So even if you keep these upcoming tips in mind, you may end up losing to sheer bad luck. Hidden arrows point players in the direction of where the treasure chest is, so follow them exactly as you try to reach the destination first. Also pay attention to any arrows your opponents uncover, as that will give you a better idea of where to go next. The treasure chest is unlocked by whoever touches the middle of it first, so if you and another player are both uncovering it at the same time, then make sure you're aiming for the center. As stated before, the huge rocks at the top and bottom are harder to dig through, making movement more difficult here, so don't go to either area without good reason. Movement through tunnels is quick, so go through tunnels that have already been made by other players if you can. Button mashing doesn't make you dig any faster, so feel free to repeatedly press A at a more relaxed pace. Castaways, a coin minigame. Many coins are drifting by in the wide, wide ocean. Cast your line and reel them in. There are three rows of items floating by, with single coins, coin bags that are worth 5 coins, and treasure chests worth 10 coins. Players have to obtain the items floating by by casting their gloves a short, medium, or long distance, which is indicated by how far the analog stick is pushed before letting go. When the player makes a cast, they have to reel the glove back whether they capture the item successfully or not. This minigame may look easy at first, but it can be deceptively tricky. The glove you cast takes a while to hit the surface of the water, so if you flick your analog stick as soon as your desired item is at the glove's landing spot, then you'll miss it by a long shot. You instead need to gauge the distance between your desired item and your glove's landing spot to figure out when the best time to flick your analog stick is. As an example, let's say this player wants this treasure chest in the third row. They should flick their analog stick once they see the treasure chest enter this sweet spot. Only then will the glove land on it for retrieval. Each item has a row that they'll show up on more than others. For coins, it's the first row, for coin bags, it's the second row, and for treasure chests, it's the third row. To maximize your coin gain, get an especially good feel for all the sweet spots in the third row, so you can retrieve as many treasure chests as possible. 
Coin Block Blitz, a coin minigame. When you hit the blocks, coins come out. Jump to hit the blocks and take as many coins as you can. There will always be three blocks that yield one coin, five blocks that yield variations of around four to 12 coins, and one block that yields a variation of around 14 to 22 coins. The game will randomize where these blocks are located each time this minigame is played, so it's possible that you may end up with a bunch of one coin blocks in your corner. Try to manage as much space as possible and plan out which block you're aiming for next. If you jump on another player, then for a short time their movement speed will be reduced and they won't be able to jump. Crazy Cutters. Cut the fossilized characters free, use the analog stick to move, and cut along the line. The possible shapes players have to cut are Goombas, Baboms, and Boos. Any player who gets at least 80 points by cutting along the outline of the character as accurately as possible will successfully cut out the shape and win the minigame. If you're moving and decide to take your hand off the analog stick, then your character will keep moving in the last direction you move them in, so you can't stop in the middle of cutting, you have to keep going with what you got. Forgetting a detail like this may cause you to go so far off the outline that no matter how beautiful the rest of it looks, you'll get zero points, so don't screw around near the end. This minigame is pretty strict. Pay close attention to the tip of your drill and the outline you're leaving behind. It will give you great insight as to how well you're doing and if any adjustments need to be made mid-match. Drilling upwards is a bit more difficult than drilling downwards since your character covers up the outline. Just remember that every shape players have to cut look identical mirrored, so the cut you'll be making going upwards will look like a reflection of the cut you made downwards. Be extra gentle with your analog stick whenever you're taking a turn. These are the parts that people lose the most points on, so mastering them will put you a step ahead. Face Lift. Pull and tug Bowser's face to try to match the example. Press A to grab the face, then hold A and move the analog stick to pull it. You can release by letting go of A. There are six facial features players can manipulate. The left eyebrow, the right eyebrow, the left cheek, the right cheek, the jaw, and the nose. Players can reset a feature to its default position by pressing the B button over it. The game chooses one of eight facial variants for players to mirror. Six of the eight facial variants are perfectly symmetrical. Players will find themselves pulling the maximum distance for every feature more often than not. Here's how to get a perfect score for each of the eight facial variants. We don't talk about this one. I can't get it for the life of me.
Grab Bag, a coin mini game. It's a coin stealing free for all. Grab players' bags by pressing B repeatedly. When grabbed, press B to escape. When stolen from, players will lose either a single coin or a coin bag which is worth 5 coins, has a lower chance of being stolen, and can only be stolen if the player has at least 5 coins. This means it's more worthwhile going for players that have at least 5 coins so you have a chance of getting a bigger reward. Just make sure you mash B as fast as you can so your opponent won't break free of your grasp. If you're being targeted for your coins then run away and jump as much as possible. No one can steal from you while you're in the air, so unless you land in a bad spot, you shouldn't lose any coins. If someone does catch you, then mash B as fast as you can so they won't steal anything. Remember that any coins lost in a minigame counts as coins lost for the minigame star as well. Hammer Drop, a coin minigame. Try to get the coins that the Hammer Bro throws down, but watch out because he throws hammers too. The Hammer Brother can throw down coins, coin bags, which are worth 5 coins, and hammers, the last of which will completely immobilize a player and make them lose the ability to pick up any items for a couple seconds. Take great care to avoid those. If you jump on someone, then they're partially flattened and their movement speed is decreased. If you attack someone with a ground pound, then they'll get flattened onto the ground and cannot move at all. Regardless of how you stun another player, they won't be able to jump, but they can still come into contact with the items that the hammer bro throws down. Falling off the tower will not let the player continue participating in the minigame, but will keep the coins the player gathered before falling. Dropped items will move towards the edge of the tower before falling off and disappearing forever. Watch the item that the hammer bro throws down each time and decide whether or not it's something worth going for. If it is, then watch the shadow of the item so you'll know exactly where to be to get it. You can retrieve items quicker in the air if you jump, but be wary of other players below since it's quite possible to land on them and catapult yourself off the tower. Hop a bomb. The ba bomb has come. Pass it to somebody with A before it explodes. The ba bomb will pulsate throughout the match until it explodes. You'll know each time it pulsates with this visual indicator of it puffing up and this sound indicator. It'll explode once it reaches around 12 pulses, so you can count how many it's on as it's being passed around to better prepare yourself. But saying around 12 pulses is only a good rule of thumb. There is a more precise way of knowing when it's gonna blow. Try to remember this low pitch sound the ba bomb makes. No other sound will do, it has to be this one. Because the third time it makes this sound in a row is when it's going to explode. On rare occurrences, it'll make this sound four times, in which case, just get the ba bomb off of you. But more often than not, if you toss it the moment it makes the sound for the third time, then you're home free. The game ends after one person loses, and that person must give five coins to each other player. Losing 15 coins in a minigame is brutal, so if there's a player that's doing well with their coins both on the board and with the minigame star, then you can put a serious damper on their game if you execute this technique right. Hot Rope Jump. The flaming rope spins and spins. Jump the rope without touching the flame. If even one person touches the Potaboo rope, they must give 5 coins to each player. However, if the 4 players reach 20 jumps, then they all win the game. While you could throw the mini game so the other players don't get the maximum amount of coins they could be getting, you'd be losing out on 15 coins yourself, so more often than not you're gonna want to play nice and try to win. The rope will spin faster at 5 jumps, 10 jumps, and 15 jumps. If all players know this, then no one will get caught off guard at the sudden speed increase and you'll have a higher chance of winning. The timing for jumping is the same regardless of your position, so if you're struggling with one position, you can absolutely look off another player's position to jump. The height of your jump is dependent on how long you hold the A button. If you tap it, then you'll do a short hop. If you hold it, then you'll do a full hop. The full hop is always preferred, even when the rope is spinning at its max speed. It simply doesn't go fast enough to warrant players using jumps low to the ground. Players tend to lose more by jumping early than waiting to jump later. If you're playing with any CPU set to a high difficulty, then jump as soon as they do. They'll rarely lose this minigame. Keep away. Open the door without letting the spike Koopas get the key. If they do, the game ends. Press B to pass the key. If the player with the key makes it to the key lock, all the players win. If one of the five spike Koopas gets the key, or if the timer runs out, then all players lose five coins. The spike Koopas AI isn't that dastardly, so whoever starts with the key should have an easy time. But if they do happen to touch a spike Koopa, then they'll drop the key. If this happens, then one of the players quickly needs to retrieve it and continue on their path to the key lock so the spike Koopas don't don't get it. The key can be thrown while on the ground or in the air. Both throws send it pretty far, so passing it to teammates in a better position is more than possible. Mario Bandstand. Be a part of the bandstand. Conduct with the analog stick and play instruments with A. Keep time to carry the tune. 
An example is played first each time, so play in time as the cursor lines up with the marks on the sheet of the music. Each time a player misses a note, they'll get hit by a hammer from the audience, which does nothing else but notify the player of their mistake. The conductor should be extra cautious to not miss any notes, as a single note for them is about equal to a couple notes for the other players. The player with the most accurate timing of playing or conducting wins. Multiple players can win if they tie for first place. Mushroom mix-up. Move quickly to the same colored mushroom as Toad's flag. If you're too slow, the mushrooms will sink. If a player falls into the water, then they lose. The last player standing wins the minigame. There's no pattern to the flags Toad raises. It's completely random. Position yourself on the black mushroom in the middle whenever you get a chance so you'll be a short distance away from any mushroom Toad selects. Once you get to the mushroom indicated, block the edges of it to make it harder for other players to get there. If they attempt to jump onto the mushroom you're on and you manage to block the mid-jump, then they'll bounce off of you and land where they started, which at that point will most likely be the water. If you position yourself for them to jump on your head, then you can cause them to catapult off the mushroom into the water as well. If you're the one caught trying to access a mushroom, then take routes that avoid the other players so you don't get blocked off. If you realize that the jump you made is about to land on another player's head and lose you the game, then you can interrupt your jump with a ground pound. If you jump on someone, then they're partially flattened and their movement speed is decreased. If you ground pound someone, then they'll get flattened onto the ground and cannot move at all. Regardless of how you stun another player, they won't be able to jump, a movement option that's incredibly necessary to succeeding in this minigame, especially when Toad starts speeding up as the game continues. Here's the most crucial tip for this minigame, so listen up. You can begin your jump towards the mushrooms while they're underwater and land on them the moment they emerge if you have good timing. This won't help you win, but it's useful for styling on your opponents, and what else is more important than that? Musical Mushroom. When the music stops, it's a dash. Be the first to jump up and get the treasure chest on the center mushroom. The music can stop after 6 seconds pass, 13 seconds pass, or anything in between. We really don't know, and there aren't any indicators to let us know when it's about to stop. You don't win by landing on the center mushroom, you win by hitting any part of the treasure chest after landing on the center mushroom. Once a player hits it, any other players left on the center mushroom will be forced to jump off. Now you could jump on a blue mushroom and then jump to the center, and you could attack other players by punching, jumping, or ground pounding them, but instead just execute a full jump towards the center mushroom from the spots on the ground that blend together in color. If done properly, you'll land on the center chest quicker than anyone else, putting you in the best position to hit the treasure chest and win the minigame. No other course of action required. Platform Peril. These platforms will fall as you jump on them. Jump across the platforms and be the first to cross the goal line. You can also collect additional coins located on a few platforms. Coin bags are worth 5 coins and won't show up nearly as often. If you jump into a pyramid of bricks, then you'll fall and will be out of the minigame. You can also fail if you don't make the platform itself, so time your jumps appropriately. The quickest way to beat this minigame is by making a straight shot for the upcoming goal. Any changes of direction, however small they may be, will slow you down, so promise me you'll only change your course if one of these three conditions are met. 1. You're so far ahead that grabbing coins won't lose you the minigame, after all, it's extra coins for the taking. 2. You're so far behind that grabbing coins compensates for the loss, after all, if you're going to lose anyways, may as well make some profit. Or three, you're about to hit a pyramid of bricks, in which case change your direction just enough for you to dodge. You can jump on the player's head to reduce their movement speed and restrict their jump, but you'll find it's just not worth it because it's both difficult and unrewarding since bouncing off of their head will most likely result in a loss for you. Running of the bulb. Run the bulb down to the socket. Punch the boos before they grab you. The hallway is full of boos which attempt to engulf and hypnotize the players. Bigger Boo makes things difficult by slowly chasing all the players down the hallway, consuming those who fall behind. They can be eliminated by punching them when they get close enough, but if they get too close to the player, they will become possessed by the Boo. Players under the control of the Boos will usually attempt to retrieve the bulb from its current holder. Alternatively, if the possessed player has the light bulb, they will walk into Bigger Boo, forfeiting the game for the players. Either situation is easily remedied, however, as a punch from an ally will snap a hypnotized player back to reality. Players must also be aware of Thwomps, who appear as obstacles and attempt to fall on players, stunning them and opening them up to an attack from a Boo. If the player with the bulb reaches the end of the hallway, all the players win, including those lost to the Boos. Failing to reach the end of the hallway or losing possession of the bulb loses the game for the players and they must each forfeit 5 coins. As common sense may tell you, don't linger around the area close to Bigger Boo, even a small mistake at that distance can prove fatal. Always be aware of your partner's locations and help out if necessary. Shy Guy says, raise the same color flag as the Shy Guy. A is white, B is red. 
players are given a lot of time to choose which flag they want to raise at the beginning. As more time passes, the shy guy will speed up and players will be given less time to make their decision. His speed will stop increasing at about 10 flag raises. Sometimes, he'll try to trick all the players by raising two color flags at once. When this happens, the amount of time players have to make a decision is increased by a tiny amount. So don't be hasty with your button press. Wait to see which one he fully puts down before choosing a flag. You've gotta be quick. This minigame will continue indefinitely until someone wins by being the last player standing or until the remaining players get knocked out at the same time, which would result in a draw. Don't be hasty at the beginning. There's no benefit to raising your flag as early as possible. When things start speeding up, pay very close attention to the shy guy's arms. If he raises only one arm, then there won't be a fake out and you're free to raise the respective flag. If he raises both arms, then take an extra split second moment to wait and see which flag he leaves up then choose that one. The fakeouts can get really tricky at times, so don't be hasty and focus on being quick at the last possible moment. Skateboard Scamper. The floor beneath you breaks up as players scamper across. Press B repeatedly to skate and A to jump. The thwomps that can be found embedded in the ground don't require precise timing to jump over, whereas the thwomps that can be found on top of the ground do require precise timing to jump over. The layout for this minigame is the same every time, so feel free to memorize the locations of everything so you don't get caught off guard. Halfway through the minigame, players will come across a coin bag that's worth 5 coins. You should definitely jump to get it, there's no reason not to. Hitting your maximum speed is easy for most of the minigame. Pressing B repeatedly at an average rate will do. However, once all the obstacles are behind you and the camera shifts, then the speed limit comes off, and the minigame turns into a button masher for the remaining players, with victory belonging to whoever mashed B the fastest. Knowing all of this, reserve your best button mashing for the very end, since it won't help you out at any point beforehand. Slot Car Derby Push the analog stick lightly and drive your slot car to the finish line. Smoking tires is a sure sign of going too fast. If you don't slow down, you'll definitely spin out. Two courses exist. On these sections, for each course, you can go as fast as you want without spinning out. For every other section, your tires will start smoking at max speed, indicating you need to release your analog stick for a brief moment before speeding up again. Memorizing the sections of the course that are sweet spots for speed, along with getting a good handle on when to briefly release your analog stick, will have you racing ahead of the other players. If a player is overlapped by another player, that player will be rammed into, eliminating them. The minigame will end in a draw if no players have reached the goal within two minutes, which won't ever happen to you unless, you know, you and your friends are just screwing around. Tipsy Tourney. Tilt the frame to slide the shell, revealing the picture beneath the panels. Uncover the whole picture. You should start with the border panels, moving to each corner once the shell starts moving towards you. Once all the border panels are near completion, move inwards to slide the shell towards the middle and make small adjustments to uncover the rest of the picture. If done correctly, you should complete the minigame when the timer is at about 15 to 17 seconds. Most players clear a few seconds below that because their shell doesn't slide where they want it to. Get a good feel for it and shoot for the time specified. Treasure Divers, a coin minigame. Dive into the sea and bring up the treasure chest from the bottom. Press A to dive. Small treasure chests only contain a single coin. Medium chests contain three coins, and large chests contain five coins. When tapping A to swim around, you can do so at a relaxed pace. No mashing required. If you touch one of these enemies, you'll be stunned for a few seconds. Additionally, if you touch them while holding a treasure chest, you will be forced to drop the object back to the ground. These enemies move in a predictable pattern that's worth memorizing. The shark methodically swims between both edges of the screen. The top blooper swims between the left edge of the screen and the center right part of the screen. The bottom blooper swims between the right edge of the screen and the center left part of the screen. These two bloopers will always cross each other up at the middle. Make sure you don't get confused which one is which as that can cost you dropping a valuable treasure chest. Go for the larger treasure chest first. If you see someone drop one, then immediately take it for yourself and reach the surface as quickly as possible. You have a limited time staying underwater. If you stay for too long, then a counter will appear on top of your head, starting with the number 5. If it counts down to 0, you will drown and float back to the surface. This scenario mainly happens when a player gets hit by the enemies more than once. Otherwise, it's not too much to worry about. Grab the treasure chest you want, avoid the enemies by memorizing their patterns, and make some coins. 1v3 minigames, bashing cash, a coin minigame. You better hope you don't play this minigame as the solo player. You're about to find out why. Hit the player in the Bowser suit with your hammer. The person in the Bowser suit must run away until time is up. Each hit will rob the solo player of a coin bag, which is worth 5 coins. The solo player can then attempt to reclaim the coin bag before another player gets it. 
The solo player can avoid being bashed by hammers by jumping on the other players. A player jumped on will have their movements be reduced, but they still retain the ability to swing their hammer. The minigame ends once the timer runs out or the solo player loses all of their coins, whichever comes first. If the solo player manages to run out the timer without losing any coins, they get a grand prize of... Nothing! That's right, nothing! The solo player can't even win any coins in this minigame. The prize is not losing coins. That's the best outcome for them. The worst outcome is losing all of their coins. This is made even worse when you remember that subtractions to your coin count in minigames also subtract from your minigame star coin count. So if you've won tons of minigames and end up losing a bunch of coins in this one, then you can possibly lose out on a bonus star because of it. For these reasons, this is an important minigame to get good at. Jump as much as possible if you're the solo player. You can't spam it sadly since the game restricts you for a couple seconds after you've made a jump, but as soon as you're able to again, go for it. If you're one of the little demons picking on the solo player, then spread you and your team out and attack the solo player from different directions. This will make it more difficult for them to avoid you. The coin bags fling out pretty far, so you can actually lay back for a bit to retrieve them easily without doing much work. Just make sure your teammates don't notice. Bowser's Bastion Cash. Like the normal Bastion Cash, except any coins that the team of three collected go straight to Bowser. If the player doesn't get a single coin stolen in the minigame, Bowser takes 15 coins from the player who landed on his space. The solo player will always be the player that landed on the Bowser space. The most optimal strategy for you to take if you're the solo player is to lose a single coin bag and nothing else. That sounds like a little bad, right? Because the earlier Bastion Cash, you don't want to lose anything, but hear me out. If you were to avoid everyone perfectly and not lose anything, then Bowser's going to take 15 coins from you. However, if the only thing you lose is a coin bag, which is worth 5 coins, then Bowser won't take anything from you. You'd be taking the lesser of two evils. If you're on the team of three, then you need to remember that any coins you get from the solo player are going to go straight to Bowser, so your focus should be on making sure that the solo player loses as many coins as possible. If you notice that the timer is running low, along with the solo player having not lost anything yet, then don't attack them anymore. Remember, they'll lose 15 coins if they didn't lose anything in the minigame, so if you only manage to steal a coin bag from them as time's running out, then they'll lose a lower amount of coins than they would have if you and your team just decided to stand still. Bowl over. Let's go bowling. The bowler uses the analog stick to aim the shell, while the people who are pins try to jump away. If the solo player knocks over a normal pin, they'll get a coin. If they knock over a player's pin, then they'll take 5 coins from the player. If you're the solo player, then it's much more worth it to hit another player's pin than a normal pin. Even hitting all 3 normal pins doesn't amount to the coins that a single player pin will give you. There's also the added bonus that you're taking coins away from that player, both what they had on the board and what they had for the minigame star at that point. Target whoever's the biggest threat to your game. Otherwise, if you can hit multiple player pins at once, then you can make a lot of coins while having multiple players lose theirs. The game ends when the shell either reaches the end of the lane or hits a wall. It's unlikely that you'll hit a wall though, since the shell is relatively easy to control. Make sure it's going in the right direction before the shot takes place. If you're one of the three players, then tell the other two to spread out. This will reduce the possibility of the solo player nailing multiple player pins and getting a lot of coins. This will also put them in a position where they have to use their best judgment on who to target since everyone's so spread out instead of easily hitting everyone's pins at once. If all three players manage to not get hit, then their reward is... Nothing! It's like a reverse bashing cash, except the people that aren't gaining anything can only lose 5 coins. While it doesn't balance out entirely, it's nice to see there's a mini game that's unfair for the three players as well. Coin Block Bash, a coin minigame. Coins come out of these sturdy blocks when you break them. The person with the hammer can break them in one hit. This is compensated by the fact that the solo player has a slower movement speed than the other three. One of the three players can steal the solo player's hammer if they wish by jumping in their head and picking it up. Only a vertical blow can be used to destroy the blocks. If this overhead blow is used on a player, then they'll be completely immobilized in place for a few seconds. This blow cannot be jumped over. It can only be avoided by dodging to the side. If the sideways blow is used on the player, then they'll be knocked away and completely immobilized for a few seconds. This blow cannot be avoided by dodging to the side. It must be jumped over. The overhead blow doesn't cover as much range as the sideways blow, but it's good to use if you want to stun your opponent without bringing them closer to a block. Inversely, if you're next to a block you want and wish to launch people away, then the sideways blow would be a better option. Cover your ground as much as possible, and don't let anyone jump on you or punch you. 
Remember, the hammer is a powerful tool, which is why it's great to get in possession of it. So if the player with the hammer isn't covering themselves well, then go for a steal. Of the 9 blocks that can be broken, 4 of them contain coin bags, which are worth 5 coins apiece, and 5 of them contain a single coin. If you, for example, notice that the 5 blocks that have been broken all contain coins, then you'd know for sure that the rest of the blocks contain coin bags. So keep this information in mind and adjust your strategy accordingly. Coin Flower Shower, a coin minigame. Coins fall down in a shower on the flower. Everybody collect as many coins as you can get. The solo player stands on the tilting flower and gets the coins that are dropped on the tilting flower while the other three players have to use boats to try to reach the coins the solo player missed. If you're the solo player, then stay within this circle and make sure the flower doesn't tilt too much. If you play your cards right by keeping the flower relatively level and paying attention to where the coins are dropping, telegraphed by their shadows, you can potentially take every coin in this minigame without leaving a single one for the poor saps in the boats. Running in small circles, making adjustments when necessary, will normally be enough. If for some reason you want one of the three players to gain a lot of coins, then you can tilt the flower in their direction. If you're one of the three players and notice that the flower is heavily tilting a direction, then make your way over there as soon as possible to retrieve the dropped coins. You can predict where the flower may tilt next by paying attention to the solo player's movements. If they play the minigame well enough though, then you can end up with nothing. Speaking of which, if the solo player falls off of the flower and into the water, the minigame will instantly end. If one of the three players needs one more coin to afford a star, then you may not even want to chance them getting that coin, so throwing yourself into the water may actually be the best move available. It all comes down to how confident you are at preventing the threatening player from retrieving any coins. Crane Game, a coin minigame. You are the Crane Game Crane. Try to grab the prizes by pressing A repeatedly. If caught, wiggle free with A. The minigame ends when the player on the crane either drops their desired object into the pipe or drops their desired object back onto the floor because they didn't mash A fast enough to hold on to it. The solo player can choose to pick up a treasure chest worth 10 coins, a coin bag worth 5 coins, or a single coin. They can also choose to pick up another player's character. If they outbutton match their opponent, then they'll successfully drop the character into the warp pipe and will take, get this, one third of that player's coins. If you're the solo player and one of your opponents is a big threat in the coin department, then you can really screw over their game if you manage to get their character in that warp pipe. What sucks is that the placements for the three characters are random, so your target may be super far away, which means they'll have more time to escape from your grasp. Weigh the distance between your target and the warp pipe to whether or not your target is a good button masher and determine from there if it's worth the risk. If you're not confident in your button mashing skills against any of your opponents, then just go for the treasure chest. It's a much safer option. If you're getting picked up by the solo player, you better be mashing as fast as you possibly can. Losing a third of your coins is an enormous setback at mid-game and end-game. You really don't want that happening. Paddle Battle, a coin minigame. Paddle your boat down the river with the analog stick. Shy guys hiding on the banks will poke you with spears if you get too close. If you're the solo player and get poked, you'll give one coin to each of the three players. If you're one of the three players and get poked, then you and your teammates will each give one coin to the solo player. Rocks are in the way, but they won't do much other than bump you a little bit. Although it may seem like the solo player is at a huge disadvantage, this minigame is actually dead even. The three players together have the same power as the solo player, so don't give up if you're alone. Rotating the analog stick quickly can be done using a few different methods, but we gotta go all out with the classic palm burner. Just don't hurt yourself. Pipe Maze, a coin minigame. Drop the treasure chest into the pipe so it falls down on you. Move the chest with the analog stick and drop it with A. The solo player is the one that drops the treasure chest. If you're one of the three players, then all you can do is try to influence which pipe the solo player picks. You can always ask them nicely to pick the one that leads to you, or you can tell them to pick the one that'll lead to them. This will make them think that it actually leads to you, so they may second guess themselves and choose a different warp pipe, one of which will be the real one that leads to you. If you're the solo player, then pay strict attention to the pipe layout as the camera pans upward. Follow the pipe that's above your head, and whenever you see a horizontal pipe, dart your eyes along to the other side, and follow that pipe upwards until you see another horizontal pipe, and so on, until you get to the top and know which pipe to drop the chest into. If you're sure of yourself, then don't let any of the three players talk you out of your decision. Piranha's Pursuit. Press B repeatedly to escape the piranha plant. Players on the cloud ground pound to feed the piranha plant with rain. If you're the solo player, then you can press B at a moderate pace. There's no need to button mash. What you really want to focus on are the obstacles in your path. The logs on the ground can be jumped over easily, but the rocks on the ground are bigger and require more precise timing so you don't hit one and slow down. 
As you're skating along, track your eyes across the background for logs. Every one of them you see will suddenly fall down onto your path, so the moment you spot one, get ready to hop over it. If you're one of the three players, then sync up your ground pounds with your teammates. If you all ground pound at the same time and repeat as quickly as possible, then the Piranha Plant will speed up and lunge further, giving the solo player less leverage with the amount of mistakes they can make. If the solo player keeps their speed at maximum and doesn't make any mistakes, then the three players cannot win. This scenario is unlikely, however, since oftentimes the solo player will slow down one way or another, whether it be to a mistimed jump or they fumble entirely because they didn't check for the falling logs in the background. If the solo player wins, then they steal five coins from each of the three players. If the three players win, then they steal five coins each from the solo player. Losing as the solo player sucks, no one wants to forfeit 15 coins, so to prepare yourself for this minigame even further, you can choose to memorize the entire layout, since it's the same every time. Tightrope Treachery The person on the tightrope must walk to the goal line. Players in boats can shoot their cannons with A. Any cannonballs that hit the tightrope itself will only serve to distract the solo player by shaking the screen violently. Direct shots to the player are the ones that will directly affect their placement. How the player falls over is dependent upon which direction the cannonball was going. For example, if the player gets hit by a cannonball coming in from the right, then they'll fall over to the left. There's also strong winds that the solo player must adjust to while they're moving forward. If you're the solo player, then you generally want to stay in the middle of the tightrope as you move along. If all three players stick to one side in a combined effort to push you off the other, then give yourself more tightrope on that side so their strategy doesn't work. Be careful though, since one of them can quickly move to the other side and catch you off guard. Only do it when it really seems like they're going to stick around there for a while. If you get hit by a cannonball, then immediately make your way back to the middle of the tightrope and continue on. Every time you get hit, you're invincible for a brief moment. So you'll always have a chance to readjust yourself. If you're one of the three players, then work together with your team and form a strategy. The three of you could keep pummeling the solo player from one side just to quickly switch to the other, or you could all work together with a gust of wind to throw the solo player off balance. Another option is for one of the three players to constantly hit the tightrope over and over again. This will give the solo player an awful time trying to figure out where they are. In the midst of their confusion, the other two players could launch direct shots at them from one direction. Mixing up these strategies and being as unpredictable as possible will increase your odds at knocking down the solo player. If the three players manage to make the solo player fall down from the tightrope or run the timer out, they win and steal five coins each from the solo player. If the solo player walks to the goal line, they win and steal five coins from each of the three players. Tug of War is a 3v1 tug of war against the player in the Bowser suit. Rotate the analog stick to pull the rope. Make your opponents laugh or something, maybe that'll cause them to screw up. If the solo player wins, then they steal five coins from each of the three players. If the three players win, then they steal five coins each from the solo player. Oh, your poor palm. Bowser's Tug of War. Like Tug of War, except the losing side loses coins to Bowser. If the minigame ends by a draw, everyone loses coins. The solo player will always be the player that landed on the Bowser space. 2v2 minigames, bobsled run. Team up with another player for a bobsled run. Use the analog stick to adjust speed and A to push the sled at the start. Whichever team matches A faster at the beginning will get a head start over the other team, which is a fantastic advantage to have. When on the track, both players should hold up to go the maximum speed. They should steer by tilting their analog sticks up left and up right. Only slow down a teensy bit when making harsh turns, otherwise you should be holding up the entire time. There are three boost pads on the track. Sliding over even a couple pixels will give you a great boost. There's no need to aim for the whole boost pad, so don't slow down and attempt it. Just go as fast as possible and graze the side of it. If you're ahead, then get a grasp on the other team's movements, ideally by screen peeking. Block them off whenever they attempt to slide past you. If you end up behind them, then look for an opening and try to sneak by them as best you can. Running into walls isn't as much of a punishment as you'd expect, but you don't want to slide along them for too long, you'll slow down soon enough. If a team falls off, then the other team still needs to reach the goal in order to gain any coins. If they fall off too, then the minigame will end in a draw. If the opposing team falls off, then the rest of the minigame for your team should be a leisurely slide down the track. The winning team steals 10 coins each from the losers. Bomb skip ball. It's 2 on 2 bomb skip ball. The first team to score wins. Press B while jumping to shoot. A player on offense can pass the ball and make a goal by shooting while on the ground, shooting while in the air, or if they shoot it in the air within the semicircle, the camera will zoom in and the player will practically dunk the bomb in. This last method is also your highest chance of success if you're on the offense team. Shooting it from the ground and in the air is unreliable since the bomb has a tendency to not land where you want it to. Getting up close to the net, I guess, for a dunk isn't that hard to do. Especially especially if you're jumping the entire time while you're moving. The defensive team will have a tougher time stealing from you if you're in the air since they won't be able to punch. 
They can, however, jump on your head to steal the Babam, but this requires amazing accuracy and timing, so as long as you're even mildly aware of their movements, jump over and over towards the net and dunk the Babam straight in there. You won't have much of a problem. This minigame is heavily weighted in the offensive team's favor. If you're caught on defense, then your best bet is for you and your partner to both jump towards the person with the Babam. While there's still a small chance that may pass you, this is a good counter strategy to anyone who's too jump happy. If you and the person with the Babam both jump into each other, they'll rebound off of you, losing any momentum they had. A grounded steal may work best at this point since your opponent will have it in their head that jumping won't work. However, the problem with stealing of the ground is that you aren't invincible at any time during the steal. So the moment you get the babam, the other offense opponent could just steal it back. This could even turn into a steal spree where it's about to see who can hold on to the babam for more than a second in order to get away and score a goal. For this reason, jumping is the preferred method for stealing the babam. If you have to steal while on the ground, then make sure it's safe to do so beforehand. The moment you're in the disadvantage, make a dash for the net and guard it as much as possible. This will make a dunk more difficult for the offense team to attain. What's even better is that the babam can be caught while in the air, so if they feel pressured and end up making an unsafe throw, then you can quickly turn the tides and they won't know what hit them. The fact that the Babam could be intercepted midair is part of the reason why passing to your teammate isn't a good idea most of the time. If you're surrounded, then the last thing you want to do is throw the Babam up in the air for them to grab it. You instead want to look for an opening and jump out of there. As said before, it sucks to be on defense for this minigame, but as long as you prevent the offense team from rushing in, then it should balance out accordingly. If one of the teams scores a goal within the time limit, they win 10 coins each from the losers. If the time limit runs out with no goal made, the minigame ends in a draw. Deep Sea Divers, a coin minigame. Team up to help raise the treasure chest at the bottom of the ocean. Press A to swim and rotate the analog stick to reel in. One player is diving down and retrieving the treasure chest. They can swim as far away from the bow as they want, but if they move right while their partner moves left or vice versa, then they won't be able to swim their desired direction. Either the player on the boat needs to be still or also move in the same direction as them. When the player diving comes into contact with the middle of a treasure chest, they'll hold on to it. While holding on, their swim speed is greatly reduced and they won't be able to swim back to the surface without the assistance of their teammate on the boat, who needs to rotate their analog stick at a decent speed in order to reel them in along with the coins the treasure chest contains. The player diving has 25 seconds of time underwater before needing to come back up to the surface for a breath of air. The game will notify players when the timer reaches 5 seconds. If the diving player doesn't get any air by the time the countdown reaches 0, then they'll drop a treasure chest that they're holding on to one and become completely immobilized. No input from the diving player will register at all. Their partner has to reel them up to the surface in order to save them and continue the minigame. The two chests on the first level each contain one coin, the two chests on the second level each contain two coins, the three chests on the third level each contain three coins, and the one huge treasure chest in the fourth level contains a whopping 10 coins. There are 25 coins altogether. If you're diving, then the moment the minigame starts, you need to make your way to the huge treasure chest as quickly as possible. If the opposing team is any good, then their plan will be the same as yours. To win the race to the bottom, tilt your analog stick down and a teensy bit towards the direction of the chest. If done correctly, you'll have swam the shortest distance and will have grabbed the huge treasure chest before the other team's diver. Careful though, that timer I mentioned earlier is ruthless to players that go for this huge treasure chest. There's barely enough time to make a full trip down and up for it. Even if you and your partner play perfectly, you'll still see the timer counting down on your way back up with it, so make sure the player on the boat starts reeling as soon as the player diving gets a hold of the goods. If the opposing team gets it instead, then swim away and settle for the three coin chests. Once those are gone, grab the two coins and then the one coiners. Obviously, if you manage to retrieve the big ten coin boy, then grab the other valuable ones too. Desert Dash, break into teams for a ski race in the desert. Push the analog stick in the same direction at the same time. Both players on a team need to push their analog sticks to the side indicated by the dialogue. The first player on a team to execute the correct input will inevitably start a timer for the second player. As in, if the second player does not also execute the correct input within half a second, then the team will get stunned for a quick moment and will have to try executing the same input again. If the second player does execute the correct input within half a second, then the team will progress by one step, and the next input will be in the opposite direction of the last one they completed. Put simply, if your team plays the game perfectly, then your input should go right, left, right, left, and so on. If your team stumbles on, say, the third input, then it may go right, left, right, stumble, right, left, right, left, and so on. 
your team can actually input the correct direction split seconds before the dialog pops up. Doing so repeatedly will make you go a bit faster, but it's a little more risky too, so only do so if you're confident in your team's synchronization. The thwomp floating in the air will slam onto the ground, rise up, and repeat the process. It'll take 6 seconds for it to rise up and 1 second of stillness before slamming back onto the ground. The amount of time players are stunned for if they get crushed is almost identical to if they mess up an input. In fact, getting crushed by the thwomp will actually move players forward a few feet, which is a much better alternative than waiting for the thwomp to rise up and moving yourself. Summed up, pretend the thwomp doesn't even exist. The winning team steals 10 coins each from the losers. Handcar Havoc. Race the handcar in teams of two. The more the two of you press A, the faster you will go. In a curve, the handcar has to be leaned to the left or right so that it will continue without losing speed. If you're taking a left turn, then lean left. If you're taking a right turn, then lean right. Both players on the team need to lean. If only one person is leaning the handcar on a curve, then you can fall off even at lower speeds, so make sure you're in sync. If you and your partner aren't matching fast enough and lose momentum, then it's difficult to build it back up. That doesn't mean you should treat this minigame as a short burst button masher though. Treat it instead as an endurance button masher. So go at a fast speed, but not fast enough to tire yourself out. It's common for teams to be so focused on mashing at times that they fall out on the curves. Remember that leaning is just as important. If a team falls off, then the other team still needs to reach the goal in order to gain any coins. If they fall off too, then the minigame will end in a draw. If the opposing team falls off, then don't do anything risky. The only thing you're racing against at this point is the clock, and it's fairly reasonable as long as you don't lose momentum and get stuck in the middle of the track. If this happens, let your handcar roll back a little and then make your best team effort to speed it back up. The winning team steals 10 coins each from the losers. Single player mini games. Ghost Guess. Find the leader of the boos. The leader is the first of all the boos to move. As time passes, the group of surrounding boos will slowly close in to capture the player. If 27 seconds pass without the player making a decision or the player makes the wrong decision, then they'll lose the minigame along with 5 coins. 27 seconds is a long time, so don't be hasty and make your decision super early. There's nothing to gain from it other than looking cool, in which case I guess there is something to gain from it, but you know, that's besides the point. <laughs> At the beginning, the boos are all spread out, making it more difficult for you to keep track of each one's movement, which definitely doesn't make the job of choosing who moved first any easier. This is why waiting a bit for the circle to close in on you is a great idea. They're all in the same space and it becomes ridiculously apparent which boo is moving before the others. When you're ready to make your decision, simply run into your target. If you're struggling, then it may do you good to check for which shadow moves first and then select the boo that the shadow is connected to. Ground Pound Ground Pound onto the flat topped posts. Try to remember which are flat and which are pointy before the butterflies land. There will always be 5 flat topped posts and 7 pointy posts. It's easy to memorize the configuration of the posts before the butterflies obscure them from vision, so you probably won't have much trouble knowing where the flat tops are. Even if you do happen to forget a few spots, some butterflies don't cover the entire post they're on, so you can make out if it's a flat top or not. If you happen to ground pound the pointy post, then you'll be stunned for a couple seconds, which normally wouldn't be good since you're running on a timer, but this timer isn't harsh at all. You could ground pound on a pointy post 5 times and still have enough time to complete the minigame. It's actually harder to lose this minigame than it is to win it, but if somehow, some way you lose, 5 coins will be taken away from you. Knock Block Tower, a stack of wood blocks comes crashing down. Break the boxes to get to the treasure chest on top. Thwomps appear alongside wooden crates. The creature's purpose is to prevent the player from reaching the top of the tower by moving their bodies to rise up before slamming down. There will always be two thwomps. The lower one will rise up and slam down first, the higher one will rise up and slam down second, rinse and repeat. Each thwomp will carry whatever's above it as it goes through its motions. If you punch a thwomp, then you lose the minigame. Punch the crates whenever both thwomps are sitting still. Once the treasure chest is within jumping range, hop up to it and claim your prize. The 10 second timer is actually something to be mindful of, so don't hesitate the moment the thwomps are still. Punching a crate while one of the thwomps are moving is a bit risky, but can yield successful results if well timed. If you lose the minigame, then you lose 5 coins. Limbo Dance Do a limbo dance under all the limbo sticks. Lean back and move forward by pressing A. Blue sticks are the tallest and easiest, then yellow and finally red, which can be very tricky. Pressing A too fast will cause you to bend too far back and fall down, losing the game. Pressing the button too slowly will also make the player lose because they'll stand all the way up and not pass under the limbo stick. It's a constant balance of making sure you're low enough for the next stick, but not too low that you'll fall over. 
Luckily, you are given a warning that you're about to bend over too far, so try to keep it the maximum bend without overdoing it, and you'll make your way underneath every stick, no matter the color. If you lose the minigame, you lose 5 coins. Memory Match Ground pound on the panels to make a picture appear. Match all pictures in the time limit to clear the game. If the player successfully matches two of the same panels, the player receives two coins. However, if the player ground pounds two different panels, both of the panels will flip back after the player realizes their mistake. Matching objects include a red mushroom, a green mushroom, a fire flower, and a green Koopa shell. To make up for the final panel that doesn't make up a pair, one of the panels in the minigame will contain a Bowser icon that will stun the player if they happen to ground pound on it. If the player successfully matches four pairs of tiles before the time limit runs out, then they will receive 10 coins. If the player, however, only matches three or less pairs of tiles, they will receive the total amount of coins from pairing up two of the images. Summed up, you'll either leave this minigame with 0, 2, 4, 6, or 10 coins. Even if you happen to get unlucky, as long as you memorize where each panel is, you should get through the minigame just fine within the time limit. Pedal power. Light up the room before you're caught by Boo. Rotate the analog stick to light up the light bulb. If you lose the minigame, you'll lose 5 coins. Shell game. The Koopa Troopas hide their chests. Find the Koopa Troopa that has the treasure. They all look identical to one another, so you need to keep a close eye on the one that has the real treasure. Their pattern of shuffling changes each time the minigame is played, but their method remains the same. They'll always spin around in circles at one point, maybe even reverse in the direction they were going to try to throw you off guard. They'll also quickly hop around, switching placements with one another. You'll see both of these methods being used throughout their swift display in an effort to distract your eyes from which Koopa Troopa has the real treasure. But don't be fooled. Lock your eyes onto the prize and try not to even blink. If you lose the minigame, you lose 5 coins. Slot Machine. Jump to hit the block and try to match the picture shown. If you get 3 of the same picture, you'll win coins. The coins associated with lining up each picture are as follows. Each of the three roulettes have their own unique cycle that they'll always roll on, but memorizing them isn't necessary because this minigame is merciful. The first roulette functions like you'd expect. Whatever picture it was on when you hit the block is the one you get. The second roulette actually makes it easier for you to land on whatever picture you got for the first one. For example, if you landed on a coin for the first roulette and hit the block on the second roulette when it's about to hover over a shell, then it'll actually skip over the shell and land on the coin instead. The same thing will happen on the third roulette if the first two roulettes have matching pictures. While you do have to time your jump to some extent, so long as you hit the block when the roulette is directly on your desired picture or the one before it, then you'll be fine. Your main focus should be on making sure the first roulette lands on the hat. Watch the treasure chest pass by. You'll see a mushroom coming up right afterwards. The moment the mushroom passes by is when you want to jump. You don't want to jump later than this moment since the jumping animation eats up some time. If done correctly, then you'll land on the hat. Now wait for the coin to pass by, and the moment it's gone, jump once more to secure the second hat. Oh, and uh, I forgot to mention, the third roulette will speed up if you manage to land on two hats. But believe it or not, this hat's the easiest one to get. Just jump the moment you see the treasure chest, its location doesn't matter. The moment you see brown, jump. There, easy 20 coins. If you don't hit the block after 9 seconds have passed for the first roulette, then it'll stop automatically. If you continue to not hit the block for another second, then the second roulette will stop automatically, and the same will happen for the third one once another second has passed. If you stop a roulette yourself by hitting the block, then the next roulette will give you your normal 9 seconds. Hit the block for the first roulette before 9 seconds pass. You really want to hold on to some time for the other two roulettes. If the coins aren't collected after a few seconds, then they'll disappear. Teetering Towers. Jump across the tops of the teetering towers. Depending on where you land, the towers tilt in a different direction. They'll only tilt forward. You control whether that's forward left or forward right. When jumping to a tower, it's further away than you think it is. I've never seen someone lose this minigame by overshooting their jump. It's always by undershooting it, so pretend it's miles away. There are two coins and one coin bag that can be found. Depending on where they spawn, you may not be able to grab all three, so prioritize the coin bag and only grab the coins if you've already gotten the coin bag or see it up ahead. The cutscene that plays at the beginning will unintentionally reveal some of the locations of the items. It's only for a split second though, so dart your eyes around for the coin bag and start jumping on the towers that lead towards it. If you don't see the coin bag in that split second, then that means it's off to the far left or the far right side, leaving you with a 50-50 scenario. If this happens, then choose a side and hope it's there. If so, great, grab it and move forward. If not, then get back to the middle and retrieve your pity coins. You have to make it to the end if you want any coins you collected to count. If you fall into the abyss, you will lose 5 coins. 
Whack a plant. Jump on the prana plants that come out of the pipes and knock them back down. And get coins for each one you jump on. The number of prana plants increases by one every time that they come out, starting at one plant and increasing to eight, filling all but one pipe. The maximum amount of coins you can earn from this minigame is 36. Out of all Mario Party tiles 1 through 7, I declare this minigame as the easiest one for a player to gain coins on. The springs will save you if you go off course, so there's no worry about falling off. You can't get hurt by the piranha plants, so there's no worry about getting stunned. Just jump on one of the piranha plants and then consecutively bounce off of every other one. If the piranha plant you want to bounce to is far away, then hold the A button to gain extra height on your bounce towards it. If the piranha plant you want to bounce to is close by, then don't hold the A button so you can execute a short bounce towards it. Even if you screw up a little, you'll still end up with a bundle of coins. You know, before making this video, I really wasn't fond of the original Mario Party. I thought that losing coins in minigames was just too harsh. I also thought that the boards weren't all that interesting. But after dissecting the game down to its core, I have a little more respect for it. Losing coins in minigames is still kind of dumb, but it does add another layer of strategy in certain minigames where you have to figure out who you want to lose coins. The boards ended up having more strategic options than I originally thought, which was surprising considering that this title has the most boards out of the 7 classic titles. While the sequel to this title will prove itself to be a bit more polished, I'll still appreciate the original Mario Party for laying down the groundwork. Thanks for watching, see you next time when we cover Mario Party 2.